How does a tiny little bird like a Carolina wren survive harsh winter conditions, like the brutal polar vortex cold spell that engulfed Missouri in mid-February 2021? Well, often they don't. These charismatic little fluff balls are normally insect eaters throughout the year, but there's growing evidence that they're changing their diet to include human-provided bird seed. Does this affect winter survival? And if so, is that a good thing? To explore these questions, we analyzed citizen science eBird data from across Missouri throughout 2021. Here's a map of the range for Carolina wrens. Though this map is static, the northern edge of the range has changed over time. Here's a map showing temperature departure from the mean during the middle of February 2021. Comparing these maps, you can see that Missouri is within the range of Carolina wrens, and it was hit by the brunt of the extreme cold. Therefore, it's a good region to focus on for the current analysis. Prior reductions in Missouri's Carolina wren population have been documented following extended periods of ice and snow cover. Population decimation had occurred at least four times since the mid-1970s. But what factors determine whether Carolina wrens survive the winter? One study in Michigan, at the northern edge of their range, assessed survival across transects in settings that included residential and rural areas, taking into account temperature as well as bird feeder presence. They expected to find a strong temperature effect on Carolina wren abundance, but found that access to food was more important. The results suggest that even small amounts of supplemental food may sometimes have large influences on birds living near their limits. So what do Carolina wrens normally eat? In general, invertebrates are a very important part of their diet. I love this photo sequence from iNaturalist that illustrates some food choices. Zooming in on this photo shows a spider and I'm pretty sure that's a true insect. I think this is a roly-poly. One of the most detailed studies about the dietary choices of Carolina wrens examined the contents of 291 stomachs from every month of the year. The contents contain about 94% animal matter, mostly insects, and not quite 6% plant matter, mostly in the form of seeds from wild trees and shrubs. The authors note that the diet was fairly uniform year-round, with nearly as many insects in the winter as the summer. My mental model had never included Carolina wrens on the list of birds that visit bird feeders. It's not that they're shy about being around humans. They're more than happy to nest in the nooks and crannies around houses and outbuildings. I've just always thought they're insectivores. They don't really go for bird seed. They're more into the self-service approach of a firewood pile with its ants and spiders and big juicy grubs. But these and copious other photos prove me wrong. Carolina wrens have been reported as visitors to suet feeders, and that kind of makes sense because suet is an animal product. But they've also been reported as really liking peanuts. And the photo record demonstrates that their willingness to visit bird feeders even extends to standard mixes of sunflower seeds and small grains. Note that these photos have a fairly wide geographic distribution. And these photos show that the Carolina wren's willingness to visit feeders extends to Missouri as well. Anecdotally, it was pretty obvious that the February 2021 cold spell wiped out a bunch of Carolina wrens in Missouri. And there was discussion on the Missouri birding listserv to this effect. But not all of the wrens died, and there was some suggestion that survival rates were higher in suburban areas. I decided to explore data from eBird to find out more. eBird is a global citizen science platform through which bird watchers report observations. I'd like to acknowledge the eBirders and staff whose efforts have made it into a phenomenal resource. eBird observations are reported using checklists collected by citizen scientists who tally the birds observed, whether seen or heard, during a session of birding. These lists also record data regarding date and location, as well as effort and observers. Note that this was a traveling list, one of the two most common protocols. The traveling protocol means that birders move through the landscape tallying birds along the way. This could be by foot, vehicle, bike, boat, or some combination. The other common protocol, stationary, involves birders tallying birds from one single location. 
if you're wondering whether anyone actually sits in one place, outdoors, on a frigid snowy day to count birds, you'd probably have a valid point. Outdoor stationary lists are probably more common on nice weather days, but stationary lists can also be done from indoors, looking out a window, and possibly watching a bird feeder. eBird lists aren't explicitly labeled regarding whether feeder watching was involved, but I think it's reasonable to assume that stationary lists are, on average, more influenced by feeder watching than traveling lists. So for our purposes, there's one more important concept with regard to eBird, and that is the concept of the complete checklist. With each checklist submitted, an eBirder is asked whether the checklist includes all of the birds that you were able to identify. eBirders are only supposed to answer yes if birding was their primary purpose, and that yes answer indicating a complete checklist comes with implications. So the reason this is important is that a complete checklist tells us not just about the birds that were detected, but it also lets us infer what birds were not detected. For example, on this complete checklist, no Carolina wrens were reported. That means the observers didn't detect any. Of course, detection non-detection isn't a perfect estimator of presence absence, but it's what we have to work with. The good news with Carolina wrens is that they're readily identifiable. They're very vocal. In fact, they're loud. You can hear them from quite a distance away. And they're active throughout daylight hours and through the year. I'd argue that detection non-detection is a better proxy for presence absence in the case of Carolina wrens than for many other species. But it's always worth remembering that the data set we actually have to work with is based on detection versus non-detection. Let's take a brief look at the methods and logic behind the analysis. I limited my analysis to eBird lists in Missouri for two reasons. First, I was doing this for an article in the Journal of the Missouri Birding Society. Second, as already discussed, the state provided good overlap between Carolina Wren Range and the extent of the February 2021 cold spell. I then applied filters to select the checklists that were most appropriate for analysis. So I included complete checklists, and I removed those that were primarily nocturnal, that were short in time duration, or that covered long distances, for example. I then categorized each list's location as urban slash suburban or rural, and I'll show you how I did that in the next slide. The rural lists were then further categorized depending on whether they were on known public lands. This created a subset of lists with a likely minimum of feeder influence. While plenty of houses in rural settings have bird feeders and may have eBird lists associated with them, I reasoned that public lands generally don't have many feeders and would be our best chance at seeing what happened to Carolina wrens without human-supplied food. I considered stationary and traveling lists separately in each of these areas, since these protocols are likely associated with different degrees of feeder influence. Overall, I reasoned that stationary lists in urban and suburban areas were likely to have the most bird feeder influence, while traveling lists on rural public lands were likely to have the least bird feeder influence. Here's how I differentiated between rural and urban areas. To illustrate the method, I'm showing maps from the central Missouri region around Columbia, but the analysis covered the entire state. I began with roads data from the Missouri Department of Transportation in which city streets, shown here in red, can serve as a proxy for populated areas. So I selected just these streets, then I made a buffer around these to generate polygons. I didn't think the small holes within these areas should be classified as rural, so I filled in the smallest ones. Then I took the points representing eBird lists and classified these as rural or urban. Here's the final result. I took a very similar approach for public lands, simply determining whether each eBird point fell within the collective boundaries of conservation areas, state parks, and National Park Service units. These don't represent all public lands, just those for which I could easily acquire boundary data. Now for the fun part, the results. As a reminder, these will be parsed by whether the eBird list protocol was stationary or traveling, and whether the lists were in rural areas on known public lands, in rural areas on other lands, or in urban and suburban areas. 
The traveling lists from public lands in rural areas are the ones we would expect to have the least influence from bird feeders. So let's start by looking at those. The x-axis shows the week of the year, so this graph spans January through December. The y-axis shows the percentage of lists that reported detecting Carolina wrens. Note that CARW is the standard abbreviation for Carolina wren. We'll begin by looking at the data from 2017 through 2020. Each of these points represents data aggregated from a whole bunch of checklists within the relevant time period. You can see there's some year-to-year -year variability, but there's a lot of overlap between years, and it's pretty common for 50% or more of lists within a time period to have detected Carolina wrens. Now let's look at the 2021 data. Wow, that's quite a drop, just when you would expect it from the February 2021 cold spell. Afterward, as few as about 10% of lists detected Carolina wrens, and look at how low the numbers remain through most of the year. So overall, there was a major drop in the detection of Carolina wrens coincident with the cold spell. This is consistent with the idea, known for decades, that severe winter conditions can kill Carolina wrens. We can't prove cause and effect from this data set, but the data fit the expectations and the signal is a strong one. Now let's look at the other end of the spectrum. We'd expect stationary lists in urban and suburban areas to have the most influence from bird feeders. This plot has the same axes. Let's begin again by looking at the 2017 through 2020 data. So you can see that Carolina wrens are common in these areas as well. One side note, I want to caution against taking any specific data point too literally. Note this group of points across several years with lower reports of Carolina wrens in mid-February. That time period includes a great backyard bird count, which produces a temporary spike in the total Missouri eBird checklists, especially suburban stationary lists, and these may differ from background reporting patterns in several ways. So this decrease in relative detection probably does not relate directly to changes in population. Now let's look at the 2021 data. Early in the year, detection rates were at the high end of the previous range, but after the cold spell, detection rates dropped to the low end of the previous range. Perhaps this represents a small decline in population, but any decline is far more subtle than the dramatic drop we saw in the last graph. We expected the results shown on the current graph to be influenced by bird feeders, and we expected that feeders might reduce mortality in harsh conditions. It appears that these data fit that narrative. Now let's fill in the other plots. In this plot, the x-axis shows month rather than week, because there just weren't enough stationary checklists on rural public lands to be able to aggregate the data by week and see a meaningful pattern. And now I'll pull up the other results. I'm not going to talk through these in detail, but there are some interesting patterns. If you want to study these more, hit the pause button or seek out the publication in the March 2022 issue of the Missouri Birding Society newsletter. The eBird results sure seem to suggest that urban areas in general, and likely bird feeders in particular, contribute to the survival of some Carolina wrens during the brutal February 2021 winter cold spell in Missouri. This was suggested anecdotally on the Missouri Birding Listserv. Keep in mind, observational data of this sort can't be used to prove cause and effect, and we should always remain open to alternative explanations for the data. Yet, if the obvious interpretation is correct, then this is yet another example of human influence becoming ever more tangled up with species and ecosystems. There are three ways we can think about this. Is it good? It's so cool that I can save individual Carolina wrens by putting out bird food. Is it bad? Uh, I'm kind of concerned that feeding Carolina wrens is fundamentally changing the species by exerting evolutionary pressure to pour dependence on humans. Is it neutral? Eh, I don't really see this as inherently good or bad. Humans altering natural systems is pretty much just par for the course in the Anthropocene. Here in our rural valley, the February 2021 cold spell wiped out 
our entire Carolina wren population, including multiple breeding pairs. A few appeared again during the summer, but the following winter had been quiet and empty of Carolina wrens, until about 10 days ago, on January 30th, 2022, when a new Carolina wren arrival revitalized our soundscape. Since his arrival, he's managed to survive an eight inch snowstorm and two nights near zero degrees Fahrenheit. Will he attract a new mate and start a new lineage of Carolina wrens here? We don't know, but we do expect the populations to rebound and we are excited to monitor this process of recolonization.